wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And it's going to be an exciting day. We have our, our newly revived choir that's going to sing for us today. So that's going to be very, very exciting. So right now, let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for being in this place, for being with each and every one of us. We ask that you will pour out your blessing upon this service and be with each of us in a special way. And we ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. scripture reading for today is Psalm 19, and I'm going to be reading out of the King James Version. I was an English teacher for many years, and to me this is the poetic version of the Bible. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the earth. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoice as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the end of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much more than fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. And if you would now stand and turn to page 292, we will sing What Wondrous Love Is This.
nice thought singing on for eternity. And if you'll uh, turn to your uh, bulletins, our fellowship song, is there something about that name? Give them a warm Ebenezer welcome.
Okay, and now if you'll turn to page 881, we will do our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Today's lovely altar flowers are given in celebration of Dick and Mary Lou Jacobson's 63rd wedding anniversary. And Dick wrote this little poem for his bride, and uh, I thought I would read it to you. We love the church, we love the steeple, we love the pastor, we love the people. We've loved each other for all these years, through all the trials, the smiles, and tears. 63 years of wedded bliss. Thank you, Lord, for all of this. And I would also like to say, today is Kenton's birthday. <laughs> and he could be out doing something else on his birthday, but instead he got up early in the morning, which is something he does not like to do. And he did two services in order to sing in the choir, and he also is doing the sound recording for the two services. So I think that's, that's pretty darn special. Yeah. <laughs> And the, the uh, announcements are in your bulletin. One that's not in your bulletin is that we're, the um, administrative council meeting has been moved to tomorrow night. So if you're on administrative council, just kind of make a note of that. Uh, any other announcements that we need to... Uh, So continuing with joy, we'll meet on Tuesday as scheduled. Okay. Any other announcements that we may not be aware of? Okay. Yeah, I will say that we, we've been signing up for the men's retreat last couple of weeks. I think we're up to 24 names on the list, and I, I know there's a couple more uh, sitting out there going to join that men's retreat. is March 23rd through 25th uh, up at Tacoa, beautiful place. Uh, cafeteria is right on the lake. Uh, we'll have, uh, we'll be, I don't know, we're going to be either, you know, shooting guns or throwing horseshoes. There'll be something else going on up there. So I encourage you, to, if you can sign up for that at some point, it's, and there's money back guarantee from the pastor that if you don't absolutely love it and it's not as good as you want to be, that we'll be glad to take care of that. So uh, looking forward to that. Uh, let's see, what else we have going on? Oh, in our... Uh, Prayer. Just a reminder, every Monday we start out with prayer right here at 9 a.m. And during Lent, after prayer, we have communion at 10 a.m. So if you can be a part of that, please do. In your bulletin, you'll notice there's a little card there for prayer concerns. If you have a specific prayer concern, please put that in the offering plate. And we'll be faithful to pray over that. If you have any note of thanksgiving, any answered prayer, any anyone that you want to give thanks for, or maybe you had seen the hand of God out in this world of wonder, put it on the uh, awesome jar there, and then we'll drop it in that awesome jar, and then we read those on Monday morning when we gather for prayer. That's what we say. Special. Special. Oh, and speaking of the church council meeting tomorrow night, just, just a reminder, you do not have to be a member to go. Now, we're to be people of the light, so anything
anything going on in this church, we need to be completely transparent. Any questions you have, thoughts, or if you want to you know, weigh in on anything, please show up. You'll be a part of that. And anything else you want to know about what's going on here, do not hesitate to ask. Is that we, we, want to be, uh, we just want to be wide open on everything that we do. And we've been very, very blessed. I'll say that while we don't, we don't like to call out visitors, we don't like to uh, put anybody out. We do have a couple here that will be getting married Saturday. So we're very happy for them. Well, we have a number of folks who are either, uh, either going through ongoing medical treatment or have some important tests coming up, some exams, and we just want to remain in prayer for them. Uh, for all the names that are listed are avoided and being faithful. What are their prayer concerns? I'm having a eye surgery on my right eye this month. My right eye is completely blind. Okay. Hopefully the doctor can do something. Okay, Mary's having eye surgery in the right eye later this month. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my brother's uh, good friend and neighbor just passed away suddenly this week, and he has a 9 and 11 year old son. The funeral services are said you can keep their family in your prayers. Um, very sudden. So. And what's that family name? Uh, I know the first name. Okay, we'll, name, so right. we'll find out and write it down. Okay. God knows who they are. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have a lady that I work with. She's a very young lady. She has two small sons, and they were just both diagnosed with alopecia. <clears throat> and uh, she's just kind of ha she's having a really hard time with that. Yeah, if you write their name down on the on card. Mm -hmm. Gigi? I, I have a couple of phrases. Um, first of all, I went to the doctor this week, and the strength in my hand is already amazingly better since my wrist surgery. Um, and I'm really encouraged by that, and I'm also encouraged by the fact that I might not be having to take medicine anymore. Mm -hmm. Also, um, I just wanted to say how much I love my job that I've only been at for three months. I just thank God for working with godly people and people who have morals and ethics. And I just, I can't say enough about it. It's just amazing. Perfect. Thanks, Gigi. <coughs> okay. Well, let's uh, have a moment of quiet meditation. Let's prepare our hearts for prayer. in the serenity of this sanctuary we have gathered here to worship you and to hear from you. Lord, we just ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us to guide us into all truth. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to the need around us. Lord, it's our desire that we would be found be good stewards of all that we have been given. Thank you so much, Lord, that we have a choir that has been put back together and for Greg's leadership in that. And, and for that, we celebrate this day for the answered prayer that we have received. We're so thankful for the miracles, the healing. Lord, not just physical, but those that dealt with relationships that have been under strain. How you're able to fix things that no psychologist, no counselor, no doctor can do. And so, Lord, with that, we have so many more concerns that it's our desire to drop them at the foot of your throne. That you would uh, heal, Lord, where physical healing is required. And for those who are facing upcoming tests, for surgery, we just pray that your presence would be felt. And in all things, Lord, that we would uh, draw closer to you and that we would know that we would never take one step anywhere that you were not right along with us. Father, we just want to lift up every church and congregation that surrounds us, regardless of denomination. We pray for those bodies of believers. We pray for the leadership in those churches, wherever the gospel is shared, that it would be godly leadership. And Lord, just that we might know uh, humble ourselves, turn our face toward you, that you would heal our land, and that we would submit to one another in love as we submit to you. And Lord, in all things, just that we would keep our eyes set firmly upon you as we go about our daily tasks and the celebrations as well as the struggles. And in all things, Lord, that you might continue to bless us with people that you are brought here that we would be faithful to and share in the gospel. 
and that we would continue to declare victory in the name of Jesus Christ. We're to celebrate this day, a wonderful day to gather like none other that's ever existed, that we would live fully in it. As a body of believers gathered here, that we could pray together in the words that our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
get ready by turning to the Gospel of John. I'm going to be reading from the second chapter. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's a pew Bible. Notes on the back of your bulletin. Be covering a couple of other scriptures today. You know, every uh, every church, every business, every home has sort of its own culture, as we do here. I'm not sure I can explain this culture to anybody else. You sort of have to experience it. I listened to some. Uh, a couple of radio personalities over the last week, they were talking about the different rules they had in their homes. Now, do you all have any specific rules in your homes growing up, or do you have rules now? One of the men had mentioned that, you know, when he was a kid, he was sort of horrified that his dad had the rule that nobody could ever wear a hat inside the home. Now, that was okay when he was four or five, six, but all of a sudden when he became a teenager, the teenage boys loved wearing hats and often would wear them backward. And then we'd have somebody who didn't know them, a family would come to the house and be like, oh no, you can't wear that in here. He says, a little embarrassed. I, I, I remember a, a man just a few years back, be a little different, but his rule for his house was nobody was allowed inside his home who had any sort of piercing other than one in their ear, which meant that, you know, if you had another piercing to come in the house, you would have to remove it. And those of you like my wife who have an extra piercing would have to know that if you take it out, there's a risk there that fill in. And then there's some, some homes who have a tradition that, you know, they don't have people wear shoes inside the house. A lot of different cultures, you know, actually they, they you know, a lot of Asian nations, they don't think it makes any sense that we walk around on carpet with shoes on. It's all these sort of different rules for different reasons. So our scripture deals with today is this one case where Jesus, and in all the scripture we find, he seems to lose his temper, he seems to get angry. Matter of fact, in some commentaries I've, I've read, you know, they make it sound like that, uh, that he lost his cool. I don't necessarily think that it was the case. I don't think it was an accident, but in the second chapter of John, I'm going to pick up with verse 13 and read through verse 25. I'm going to follow along. I have a NIV version. It says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered, it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. So here's the one instance where Jesus really does seem to, you know, get mad and angry. Of course, we know we're not supposed to get angry. But the truth is, if Jesus had really lost his cool, if he'd really been that upset, he wouldn't have made a uh, whip out of cords, he'd have, he'd have called down fire out of heaven. Right? He would have called upon angels to come down and destroy the whole scene. But actually, I think his response was not only tempered and measured, you know, because he was just angry and started kicking tables over. And I thought, well, when you get really angry, what do you do? And like, you lose your temper every now and then in traffic. You ever, you ever that, that moment of irrational when you just sort of you know, go nuts for a little bit and you start chasing somebody until you realize what you're doing? Most people have been in that situation. But the fact that... You're smiling a little too much, Peter. What Jesus, uh, 
But the fact that he actually made a whip out of cords meant that he was a little deliberate in his actions. And so he goes and in, in, uh, knocks the tables over that have the coins on and then drives out those who were selling these keys. And he, this is meant to be a house of prayer. And you've turned to it as like a marketplace. Now understand, I don't think what Jesus is saying, that it's not okay for us to have a barbecue, that it's not okay for us to have a yard sale or churches that have bingo. The, the specific instance here in this, in this temple place, in this courtyard, is that what was really happening was there were people from all over the known world, there were Jews who were coming to celebrate Passover, and celebrate Passover, you'd make a sacrifice, whether if you had natural, normal, if you had good resources, you would buy a spotless lamb, a sheep, or if you didn't have resources, you'd, if you were poor, you'd buy a dove. And by the way, speaking of that, if you remember when Jesus was born and then he was offered, when he was dedicated to the temple, you know what the sacrifice his parents made? It wasn't a spotless lamb, it was, it was doves, because obviously he didn't have money, and that was offered. And so you would also to come and, at this time and you would pay the temple tax. And to pay the temple tax, you'd have to use a temple coin. You couldn't use a coin that had Caesar's inscription on it or his likeness. You would have to have a coin from the temple. So here come the money changers and here comes those selling them. Have you ever been in a situation where you were sort of vulnerable to the market forces? Say you went to the airport and you wanted to buy a hot dog. They're not the same price they are in other places. Or you go to the ballpark, and let's see, I got, the, uh, I got a Coca-Cola and some French fries and a pretzel. Yeah, it'll be $19. Well, why is it that much? They're just sort of, they're gouging you. They're taking advantage of you, right? And same out when there's a, natu a, a natural disaster, a flood or a hurricane or something, and what happens? Bottle of water, somebody wants $5 for it because they can and so it was with these people who had set up shop in the temple. Is that all of a sudden people traveling from unknown places and you didn't bring your own dove with you, you, you didn't have a, a lamb with you, and so they would have to buy these, and because it's sort of, you know, the captive market, we can charge you a little extra money for it. And not only that, but they would also have to pay, once they purchased these animals, they would have to be inspected by a rabbi to make sure that it was ceremonially clean. And so Jesus sees this, and he's understandably outraged. You have people who are taking advantage of those who are trying to do the right thing. Let me tell you, there are a few, few themes in Scripture from, from the, the beginning to the end that are more consistent when those who have authority, those who have ability, those who have a power not to take advantage of others. And so with our gifts and our talents, the question is, you know, there is worldly wisdom. There's people who are shrewd in the ways of the world, shrewd in how to make money, shrewd how to make a sale, how to get a, get a good deal for something. Not so within the kingdom of God. And so Jesus comes and, and he's called cleansing the temple, driving them out. What's interesting in the response, now think about this. Now, you know, oftentimes we think of Jesus as being, as being very humble and meek, and he is. And the picture of him, he just looks very serene and peaceful. He had to have a physicality about him. Let me tell you, if you have men there, you have people there who have a little shop with animals, and he runs the animals off, and he's kicking tables over that have money on him, there's money scattered. There had to be something about him that, that kept people from stepping forward and protecting themselves and just sort of backing off. There had to be something in his presence that was formidable enough that they backed off. And so I love the response of the Jews. The, the Jews don't say, they're not like, well, you're not allowed to do this against the law. They, they don't really argue with what he's doing because deep down they must have known there was something to it when he said, you know, my father's house is a house of prayer. And so what they ask him is not, you know, this is illegal and you made a mess here. Instead, they don't call for his arrest. What they say is, show us a miracle or something to show you have the authority to do this. What gives you the right to do this? Interesting response. It says, okay, I'll destroy this temple and raise it up in three days. Now, that's an interesting response for somebody who's just about cleansing the temple, right? Somebody's just got to this great act of driving everybody up to purify this temple, and yet what he's saying is, yeah, I'm going to give you a miracle. I'll destroy this temple. Of course, your response is, 
took 46 years to build this temple. And you think you can rebuild it in three days. Of course, Jesus, the scripture was talking about his body. And so this time of Lent, the season, is a time that, that we're to be reflective. And the idea that, you know, that we want to be meditative and some of us are going to a Daniel fast and this idea that, you know, we want to sort of be introspective and prayerful. And so Jesus cleanses the temple and the things that the Lord, the Lord wants things sanctified, set apart for his use. And it's kind of interesting. If you really think about it, everything in the world is the Lord's, right? He's created everything. It belongs to him, including us. So if everything is the Lord's, and they've dedicated this one little area of the temple, and it's like the world wants to take control of that as well. Like, can't we even separate, set this one apart for God's use without making money there? Well, so it is with us. So under the new covenant, what we know is, where does the temple of God reside? And by the way, that temple was destroyed, right, in 70 A.D.? That temple's not there anymore in Jerusalem. And that time was going to come when Jesus sending his Holy Spirit, and now what Scripture says is, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It talks about us maintaining our purity. Now, we don't really, we don't really focus much on holiness. That's kind of a word that you know, we don't throw around much. John Wesley and Charles Wesley, who are the founders of United Methodism, they attended Oxford, and at Oxford they started a little club. Did you all start a club in college? Well, their club was like a little club that was all focused on accountability and studying Scripture. And it was all sort of revolved around that, and, and they were sort of mocked by the others in Oxford. It said they were called to, that's the Holy Club. Right? That's what they called it. It was a, a term of derision, Holy Club, but it was actually true, because what their focus was really on was grace and faith and holiness. And what holiness really means being set apart. Holiness is for a particular use. You know, there was some years ago that uh, at Mount Bethel they were having a baccalaureate service for the graduates, and they invited a local rabbi to come in and, and speak to the graduates. And, and the pastor of that church said, the rabbi's welcome to come speak in this church, but he's not allowed to speak from that pulpit. As that pulpit has been set aside, that pulpit has been sanctified for the proclamation of the gospel. So he's allowed to come in the church and speak, but he's not going to speak from that pulpit. And, and a lot of folks were outraged, and boy, what an insult. I, I could not agree more. There's some things that are set aside for a particular purpose. Some years ago, I started the Chalice Collection. It, would, it began by some of our youth who had gone to Costa Rica, and they bought me a chalice, and it was a nice thing. I started using that, and then some people started giving me more, and now I've got chalices. Well, if you, if you come to our home and you want something to drink, I've got a lot of glasses and cups you can drink at you're not going to have a Coca-Cola at one of those chalices. Because those have been set apart for a special purpose. The Lord has set you apart for a special purpose. And, and we are to be, we are to carry ourselves in, in such a way to walk in holiness. It doesn't mean we walk in perfection. But it means to be useful to God is get rid of that chaff, get, get rid of those things that are of the world to make myself useful for the kingdom. And see, in the Old Covenant Testament, when they had this temple, and they had the outer courts where uh, people were allowed to gather, and, and basically Gentiles, people got in this outer court, and then they, then they had an inner court, and they had a holy place in the temple. Then the Holy of Holies was the most sacred place, small little room, and the most Holy of Holies was going to have a, a large curtain, very heavy curtain, very tall curtain, not like we think a curtain now that we would have in a normal window. But under, behind that very heavy curtain was represented the very presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. And once a year, the high priest would enter that place to make an offering for the people. He would sprinkle the blood of bulls and goats, and he'd sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, offering sacrifice, that one time of year during Yom Kippur. Now, this is not in the Bible, but the tradition is, what we believe is that when the high priest went into that that most holy, that high holy place once a year, that he had a rope tied around his ankle in case he dropped dead in the presence of God, that nobody could go after him. I'm not you going after him? I'm not going. So they could just pull him out. So he entered that place in fear and trembling 
understanding that he was ceremonially clean, but he was still a man, which means that he wasn't perfect. And who, who among us would be able to stand before a perfect and holy God? And so he went in, offered the sacrifice, and had a rope tied around his ankle. Of course, when Jesus went to the cross then, and you know when he died on the cross, and, and the earth shook and the skies darkened, and another physical sign happened. Remember what that other physical sign was? The curtain on that most holy place. The holy of the holies. That curtain was torn from top to bottom, which means it was torn by the Lord, and ripped open, which represents now access to God, is now not just for the high priest once a year, but for us. And so now, instead of fear and trembling and going in there and quaking with a rope tied around our ankle, we are called to enter that most holy place with confidence because of what Jesus did. And so it says this is the new covenant now which Jesus promises once we were cleansed from our sin, from his mercy and forgiveness at the cross, now I go back to that original perfection that was from the Garden of Eden when God walked with Adam and Eve. I go back to that original perfection and now Jesus would say, you are ready, you are willing, you are able to be filled by the Holy Spirit. And that's what our eternal life is. The eternal life is that Holy Spirit who can dwell among, who dwells within us, and then we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, then the ministry is to minister to each and every one of us just as we are. And the first promise of the Holy Spirit when he comes is he, he convicts us of sin and whispers to us about just those things that I can clean up in my life. And the reason is for a purpose, to get rid of that, get rid of the chaff so that I can be more effective in representing him. That's why you've got to be people of the light. I want to expose everything in life for the Lord to deal with it, not to hide and cover it up, because in this cleansing, it's to be set apart for a purpose, to be used for something holy. The world has plenty of territory. The, the world has plenty of spokespersons. The world has plenty of things at its disposal. But we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, should be pursuing, pursuing grace through faith and then holiness. It's the power of the gospel and it's the imitation of Christ that, that we can then share this message with a lost and hurting And I know with these things that we see a physical representation to at this spiritual, deeper meaning. And so what Jesus did there at the temple, his, well, his promise is really to continue to do that in our lives. And in speaking to each and every one of us individually where we are in his purpose of getting rid of those things that are, that are, not, that are not God. And so the Jews say to him, show us a miracle. Show us a miracle. You can prove you have the authority to do these things. And indeed, he, he does have the authority. But he's just not a passive, he's not a passive Messiah who sits back in a corner, but he's an active, powerful, living Lord. And his desire is to work through us. I love Psalm 51 and verse 10. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Isn't that beautiful? And so here's my question. You know, while we, while we wrestle with maybe those things that, that we know are impure, that's a prayer. The thing is, a lot of times in our, our effort in pursuing religion, which is just a, a lesson in frustration, you know, religion all it does is point out all my errors, make me feel inadequate I am. The prayer is, create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. That's a cry out to God. That's his work. It's his desire that we would be useful instruments. It's desire that we would be found as acceptable and holy and have a purpose. So my question, do you pray for that? Do, do you make a self-effort to clean yourself up or to get over something? I've got a habit I'm going to get rid of. You pray to the Lord say, Lord, I've got this habit. I've been built this. I, this isn't helping me or you. Lord, fix this. Help me. I'm powerless to get over it. By the way, we're in the, this Daniel fast. What's been one week now? I've been without caffeine now for a week. 
the first few days were ugly. It was ugly. I'm going to play racquetball like Wednesday. I thought, okay, I'm feeling a little better Wednesday, sort of. About halfway through the uh, second game, I'm still like reeling. You know, I'm like wobbling around, you know, and I'm about to collapse. And the guy I'm playing is, man, are you okay? Sort of. A little tired here. But the fasting is not just for giving up food. It's, it's, the, the purpose is not just that uh, I'm doing without stuff. It's not to lose weight. The fasting is to help focus, to find a purpose. So the Lord can whisper to me, and the Lord can say, here's something in life, here's a struggle, here's something I want to deal with with you. And my prayer would be, Lord, I, I've, been, I've been struggling with this for a while. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart. Renew me, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. That's not religion. That's Christianity. The Christianity is, it's not me, it's Jesus. And so his desire is to cleanse, to purify, to make useful, not just for the sake of being clean, for the sake of serving others. And so I'd ask you as we continue on in Lent here, in this, this time of introspection, this time of prayer, this time of to sort of spiritual discipline. Think about what you're praying about. We have a lot of things we want to pray for. There's a lot of people and situations and, and leaders and issues, and those are all good, important things, and don't stop that. But while we're doing that, what is it that the Lord may want to change in me? What is it He wants to deal with that I may be helpless to deal with? Things He wants to do that I can. Oh, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit. Lord, through your promise, may you speak individually to each and every one of us through the power of your Holy Spirit, not in verbal spoken words, but to our heart. And Lord, may we be sensitive in listening. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord, that we might know what it is you want to deal with in our lives that we can get rid of, leave behind, that we could drive out so, Lord, that we can make ourselves worthy of being used by you, cleansed and holy, set apart for a purpose, not to serve ourselves, but to serve others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> One of the uh, ways that we remember what the Lord wants to do through us is through this act of celebrating Holy Communion, which we do the first Sunday in every month. is one loaf and one table we're all same before this this last supper the remembrance that on that night that Jesus gave himself up for us meeting with his disciples and I keep thinking about when, when they met for that Passover meal when he said these words when he took that bread what they must have been thinking what must have been going through their, their heads when he took that loaf and he broke the bread, and then he gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was ended, he took the cup. This would have been the third cup of that Passover celebration, the cup of redemption. And he gave thanks, gave the cup to his disciples, and he said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is my blood the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, through your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, help us to remember. Lord, we ask that you would consecrate these gifts of bread and juice and make them become for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ that we may be the body of Christ for the world, sanctified by his blood, useful for his service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to ask those who are assisting with service to come forward at this time.
We actually have communion bread down here that is, it's been approved for the Daniel fast. And it's also uh, gluten-free. Yeah, so, so as we come forward for communion, if you're on the Daniel fast, you need gluten-free. If you want to serve yourself some bread, and you can uh, dip it in the cup. And a reminder to everyone that in the United Methodist Church, this communion table is open to all who would receive it because this table does not belong to the United Methodist Church. This table does not belong to Ebenezer. This is the Lord's table. That means he paid the price for it. That means you all are invited. So as you come forward, we'll have two sets. We'll have a, a set here and there. You're welcome to come and spend some time at the altar. Any money left at the altar goes to Beat the Drum Village. That's the uh, AIDS orphanage in Kenya that we support. The table has been prepared. Come now as you would. and turn to page 378. We will do our closing hymn, Amazing Grace, the first, third, and sixth verse.
with hearts full of assurance that the good work the Lord has begun in you, He will continue until that day He returns. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.